Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Live at Four. It's, it's Friday. Friday. And it's a beautiful one, yes, it too. it's a fantastic Friday. And Michael Bruno, as you may have heard, will be along. <laughs> and Lola will wrap up the week, so we have a busy Friday ahead. So let's get to the moon. Let's get to the news. A man accused of killing his wife and blowing up their house is in court for a sentencing hearing. We'll have the very latest. An investigation is underway as CBS executive Les Moonves is being accused of sexual misconduct. And a serious fungal disease that attacks a popular garden shrub has been found in Wisconsin. The boxwood blade. Yes. Let's let's take a look outside today. One of the prettiest views in Madison from mm -hmm. Olin Park. Look at that shot. That's it's got a it postcard. All, doesn't it? Yes. The weather words for today. Fantastic Friday. And the fantastic Chris Reese is out <laughs> in the backyard patio, hopefully with more good news. That's right. This weather is going to really kind of linger into the weekend. It's absolutely fantastic. I think for a Friday night, this is some of the best weather you can get. Highs, though, are below average, but it still feels absolutely fantastic. We made it all the way to 77 degrees today, 4 degrees, just shy of that average high of 81 degrees. And that below average weather is going to continue for the next several days. High temperatures pretty much all across Wisconsin did indeed make it into the 70s as anticipated. Most folks were into the low and mid 70s. Here's a live look outside right now showing you those clouds have broken up a little bit. So it's absolutely beautiful out here. It will remain beautiful into the rest of the afternoon. 77 the temperature right now. We're keeping those winds out of the northwest at eight miles per hour. For the rest of the afternoon and evening, expect that sunshine to continue. Temperatures falling through the 70s and 60s. If you're going out tonight and you have that opportunity to sit outside, I would take that opportunity because it's going to feel good just about all night long. Let's go ahead and show you guys first alert traffic and how that's shaping up. Here's a live look at the Beltline in Park Street. Traffic is moving along, but we are going to watch an increase in that volume. Of course, we're already starting to see some of those Friday Beltline slowdowns, and that's what we're going to continue to see for the rest of your Friday, not only on the Beltline, but downtown. So of course, an awesome afternoon like this is going to come with a little bit of a price, and that is going to be that increase in traffic as folks head home and get ready to head out and about. But of course, I will have the full detail in your forecast and updates and traffic coming up a little bit later in the show. Guys. All right, we'll see you then. Thank you, Chris. My Thank pleasure. You. Thank you, Chris. First at four, the man convicted of killing his wife and exploding his Madison home last year year will spend the rest of his life in prison. A Dane County court, a Dane County judge that is ruled today that Stephen Pyrus will not be eligible for parole. Rose Schmidt is live at the Dane County Courthouse with the very latest. Rose. That's right. Well, Judge Nicholas McNamara says what Pyrus did was not an act of love. He called Pyrus a liar and says he has not earned the right to be believed. Pyrus pleaded guilty to killing his wife, Leanne, sometime before September 13th last year. He confessed to loosening a gas line to a dryer in his house, causing an explosion that leveled their home on Madison's west side. The judge says the public deserves for Pyrus to die in prison. My conclusion is that you should be confined in the Wisconsin prison system without an opportunity for supervision. You have earned that. You deserve that. Our community deserves that. Pyrus did not speak in court, but his attorney argued that his motive for killing his wife is still in question. Leanne's brother also testified, saying he never thought this could happen to his family or to his sister. Now, the judge says that Pyrus does have the option to appeal this decision, and he says that it should give Pyrus some peace of mind knowing that he will die in prison. Rose Schmidt reporting live. Rose, thank you. A Madison man is facing attempted homicide charges in connection with a shooting that injured a man on Madison's south side in June. Madison police say 20-year-old Kenneth House Jr. was taken into custody yesterday near Vera Court on suspicion of attempted first-degree intentional homicide. Police say a 59-year-old Madison man was taken to the hospital after he was hit by gunfire in a home in the 1200 block of Gilson Street on June 27th. According to the report, the shooting appeared to be targeted and is believed to stem from a pre-existing conflict between House and the victim. Police said that House had a loaded handgun in his pocket 
at the time of his arrest. Greene County deputies say a fatal crash that happened this morning may have involved alcohol. Deputies responded just before four to a single vehicle crash on State Highway 11 at County Road S in Jefferson Township. A car was traveling east on Highway 11 when it left the road and went into a ditch rolling several times. One person died at the scene and another was taken to the Monroe Clinic emergency room with serious injuries. The crash remains under investigation. New video of that explosion that happened in Sun Prairie has been released. It's video from a Sun Prairie utility surveillance camera, which looks over the Sun Prairie Supplies parking lot. The explosion happened on the other side of the road. It just happened right there. A few buildings down. It shows the moment of the blast. You can see one person getting knocked to the ground in the video. A short while later, first responders arrived as the fire intensifies. Volunteer fighter, firefighter and business owner Captain Corey Barr was killed in the explosion. Crews have finished their investigation, but the area is still blocked off to the public for safety reasons. One of the most powerful men in entertainment is now caught up in allegations of sexual misconduct. The independent directors of CBS are investigating allegations of personal misconduct against chief executive of CBS, Les Moonves. The New Yorker is set to publish an article focusing on Moonves's behavior, which The Hollywood Reporter says will include claims of unwanted kissing and touching. The allegations go back at least 20 years as well as more recent ones. Moonves has been CEO for 15 years and is married to CBS personality Julie Chen. The allegations come just months following the firing of CBS anchor Charlie Rose after allegations of years of misconduct. A new federal lawsuit claims Ohio State University received multiple warnings alleging students were being sexually abused by a former team doctor. Richard Strauss, who died in 2005, worked at OSU for 20 years. The school says more than 100 people, including former athletes and patients at Student Health Services, have now come forward accusing Strauss of abuse. Ron McDaniel told a school representative his conversation with Dr. Strauss felt flirty and not at all appropriate. He reported that the doctor pushed his groin against him and gave him unnecessary testicular and rectal exams. He was a doctor. I was a student. I went in there vulnerable. I was even more vulnerable because he had me declothed and I'm sitting there in front of him and everything's going really badly. Ten men who filed a new lawsuit against Ohio State University accusing the school of fostering a ingrained in culture of institutional indifference that succeeded in keeping Dr. Strauss two decades of serial sexual abuse buried. Ohio State launched an independent investigation in April. Investigators searching for a missing college student in Iowa hope that a trail of electronic information will help find her. Molly Tibbetts is a sophomore at the University of Iowa. She vanished last week after going for a run. When she disappeared, Tibbetts likely had her cell phone and a Fitbit on her wrist to track her run. Investigators have built a detailed timeline of her movements before she disappeared based on eyewitness accounts, cell phone tower pings, her Fitbit data, and social media activities. They do not think she returned home that night, but they also don't think Tibbetts ran away. We're hoping to be able to precisely um, examine and know where she was, when she was there, the pace she was running, walking, jogging, heart rate, anything that that kind of stuff monitors. Police have issued warrants to social media companies to get Tibbetts account information and there are at least 12 FBI agents analyzing that and other information. As for her Fitbit and her cell phone, police believe they've either been turned off or the batteries have died. 88 wildfires are burning right now around the country. The car fire in Northern California exploded overnight to more than 44,000 acres. Homes were still on fire this morning after a night of devastation in Shasta County, California. A firefighter, uh, the fire killed one firefighter who was operating a bulldozer and one from the city of Redding. Thousands have been evacuated and dozens of buildings have been destroyed. The government reports the U.S 
U.S. economy is growing at its fastest pace in four years. President Trump celebrated the news today in the White House Rose Garden. Newly released government data shows the U.S. economy grew 4.1 percent from April to June. That's up 2.2 percent during the first quarter and the fastest pace in four years. But some economists caution such rapid growth is just not sustainable because temporary factors fueled the latest surge accomplished an economic turnaround of historic proportions. The first thing to do is get our national debt under control and not try to grow the economy with short-term stimulus, which is a sugar high, and then it leads to a crash. The Commerce Department says Americans opened their wallets following last year's tax cuts. Companies also increased hiring to replenish de depleted inventories, and exporters rushed more of their products into the global market because of uncertainty in growing U.S. trade disputes with China. North Korea is fulfilling a promise made during last month's summit between President Trump and Kim Jong-un. For the first time in more than 10 years, North Korea is returning the remains of U.S. troops killed during the Korean War. One by one, boxes wrapped in blue United Nations flags were taken off a U.S. military plane in South Korea. The remains returned today are believed to be some of the more than 200 that North Korea has, but about 7,700 U.S. soldiers are still listed as missing. A serious fungal disease that attacks a popular landscape plant has now been found in Wisconsin. It's known as boxwood blight, and this is the first time it's been found here. Eric Franke's in the News Center with more details on this. Eric. Well, Mark and Susan, this sounds relatively benign, right? But boxwoods are very popular in Wisconsin for hedges, for foundation planting. So the Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumer Protection wants people to be aware of it, mainly because of the long-term impact of the fungus associated with it. The spores can actually stay in your soil for six years. Inspectors found this blight back on July 19th. Brian Kuhn is the director of the Bureau of Plant Industry. He says they look for such diseases in large scale production nurseries. It starts with brown spots on the leaves of the plant. He says people should pay close attention to their boxwoods before they planting any, plant any of them right now. The encouragement is to really look, look those plants over closely before you pick them up if you're at a nursery setting or, or working with a landscaper um, to, to make sure they're evaluating this and, and have an awareness that, that boxwood blight has been detected in the state. Now, this blight can also affect a ground cover that's called Pachysandra. You can call your local extension if you think your plants may be affected. And Kuhn says once it is confirmed, he asks you dig it up, double bag it, take it to the landfill so those fungal spores are contained. Otherwise, as we mentioned, this could be something that stays in your soil for up to six years. Mark and Susan. Oh, it's been a bad year for yeah, fungus. Yeah, Lisa Briggs things. has been mm -hmm. talking about that. Yeah, That's Eric, right. Fra Eric Franke in the newsroom. Thanks, Eric. You're welcome. A reminder to drivers as a portion of McKee Road will be closed over the weekend for construction work. Officials say McKee Road will be fully closed between Pleasant View Road and Meritor Way starting at 7 p.m. today. The closure will last until 6 a.m. on Monday. Construction crews will be installing sanitary sewer as part of the County Road M reconstruction project. Well, ahead on News 3 at 4, we'll talk about using emojis to communicate. Plus, shipping containers are being transformed. We'll show you how when Live at 4 continues.
There are approximately 20 million freight containers transporting cargo all around the world. But one New York City-based company is giving some new life to old steel. The company SG Blocks transforms shipping containers into homes and businesses. It's completed projects in all 50 states, including a Starbucks in Salt Lake City, a restaurant in Long Island, New York. Paul Galvin, the owner of SG Blocks, says the structures are safe, strong, and sustainable, and they cost 30 to 50 percent less than traditional building methods. This building methodology, uh, modular prefabricated construction, is what's going to cure the housing crisis in America. You're that optimistic? I am that confident. A typical project takes six weeks to build and just hours to install. I You're, told you about this years ago. Mark's way ahead of his time. You've wanted to do this for a long <laughs> That's time. Right. Down in Costa Rica. I'm going to have my little container house. You can come and visit. <laughs> okay. It was a rough day on Wall Street as tech shares pulled down all sectors. The Dow Industrials lost 76 points, ending the day at 25,451. The tech heavy NASDAQ composite index fell 114 points. The S&P 500 was off 18. Well, World Emoji Day was last week. But in today's world of communication, every day can be a day full of emojis. Emoji is a Japanese word that means picture letter. They're those small digital pictures that express feelings or emotions instead of using words, usually in text messages. For Joanne Peck, emojis are serious business. Peck is an associate professor in the marketing department at the UW School of Business. Hi, Joanne. Good to see you. Hi. Thanks for having me. Now, you've taken a, a closer look at this and done some research on yeah. it. What, what were you looking at specifically? So I have two former students, one Victor Barger at University of Wisconsin Whitewater and one Andrea Luangrath at University of Iowa and we've been working on this idea of textual paralanguage which are non-verbals in text. Okay. So for example when we're talking face to face if you said would you like to go to a concert I can say I guess I'll go mm -hmm. or I can say I guess I'll go. <laughs> but you know, the words are the same, but the nonverbals are different. So think of emojis are one example of textual paralanguage, and we've looked at brands and how they use textual paralanguage. So what did you find? So in general, what we found, overall effect, is that brands should be somewhat careful because consumers can question the competence of a brand if they use too much emojis. Oh, well, that's interesting. And we thought at first that maybe brands would seem warmer if they use it. But if you think about all caps, that's a nonverbal. So it's like someone screaming at you. That's not really that warm. Mm -hmm. So what we found is, of course, there are exceptions. But in general, brands should be careful because it's very informal. And if you want to be very informal, fine. But if not, you should be really careful. They're fun brands and they're serious brands. Exactly. Yeah, and categories. So fast food, fun category, whereas something like maybe financial services, it's they care more about appearing competent. Is using emojis um, an age-related thing or a gender-related thing? Because anecdotally, it seems I use emojis a lot. Yeah. It, do more women use them? I mean, do you use emojis, Mark? No. No, see. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would use that one right there. The, crying. Crying. Laughing so hard you're crying. Oh, why is the, what's the blue one with the ice? He's freezing to He's death? Cold. That's a good Wisconsin one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe I'll use that one. <laughs> yeah. But are there certain groups that use them more? Yeah. I mean, in general, younger people tend to be more informal, and they are used to that informality. So older people maybe don't use them quite as much, and women tend to use them a little bit more than men. But just like in an interpersonal relationship, if you know a brand and you go there, when they use them, you know they're competent. So it's not going to really hurt their competence. It's more if it's more professional or an unknown brand and you don't know anything, if that's your first impression, it might not seem like they're very competent. I got, I got a message once from a friend who was all emojis with like an entire sentence. I couldn't figure it out. I called him up. What do you want? Yeah. You know what's interesting about that is people think that other people understand the meaning, mm -hmm. but often, especially across cultures, people have completely different interpretations Absolutely. of the meaning. So although you think you're expressing and helping with the meaning, sometimes you're actually hurting it. Be careful with it. Very Be careful. interesting. Uh, okay. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, that was really interesting. interesting. So Great much. to see you, Joanne. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, ahead of four, it's been 40 years since the first successful birth of a baby born through in vitro fertilization. We'll tell you how technology is helping families grow when Live at Four continues.
Take a look at this to say Koa Smith was in the right place at the right time is an understatement. Perched precariously on his surfboard, the 23-year-old from Hawaii rode a wave off the western shore of Africa for 120 straight seconds, two minutes, spanning nearly a mile, staying upright as he traveled through an unheard of eight barrels. That's the hollow formed by the curve of the waves as it breaks over a rider's head. Almost as amazing, Smith and photographer Chris Riders Rogers filmed the entire ride using both a drone and a GoPro attached to a mouthpiece that Smith wore while he rode. I was just going to say the photography there is spectacular. Two minutes on one wave. That's incredible. Unbelievable. Beautiful. Today is Friday, uh, July 27th, and considering the video we just saw, it's appropriate. Today is National Get Gnarly Day. <laughs> Surfers use the term to describe the waves they tackle. It's also National Scotch Day. This particular whiskey must be made in Scotland and it must be fermented from malted barley and aged in oak barrels for at least three years. And it's National Chicken Tenders Day. Fast food chains across the land are celebrating with discounts. Anyone who says the magic words winner winner chicken dinner at Wendy's <laughs> received two free chicken tenders and the fun doesn't stop there. Sunday is National Chicken Wing Day, so go ahead and plan ahead. You took advantage of this. Did you have to say I it? I did. I didn't have to say it. I went over to the Wendy's on lunch <laughs> break because I forgot my lunch today, and so it sounded like free food, so I went. And I just asked for some chicken tenders, and there you bam, go. it was right there. So you got time to celebrate yet this evening? Uh, exactly. <laughs> so if you haven't gotten time to go yet, go ahead. It's going to be a spectacular weather uh -huh. evening as well. Eat your so tenders if you have outside. A chance, yes, to eat outside, definitely do so. I've got your full weekend breakdown coming up. When we come back. And it's been another one of those spectacular summer days that feels much more like fall. Temperatures, though, still below average. We topped out right around 77 degrees normal for this time of the year 
is 81 degrees. Temperature right now is actually at 77. So we're seeing our high temperature for the day at this very moment. Winds out of the northwest at eight miles per hour. Those dew points into the 50s, which is a large reason why the air feels so good. It's a little bit of a drier air mass in here as opposed to other times of summer. Dew points in the 40s as you work your way back to the north and west. It's that same dry air that's going to be sticking around because we've keep it, we're keeping those winds coming out of the north and west as we go through the rest of the afternoon and evening, which means it's absolutely going to feel spectacular. In fact, dew points will be staying low through the 50s, especially as we go into your Saturday as well. The only thing to worry about really is cloud cover. No rain chances uh, to be noted as of today with that dry air around. We'll get some rain chances into the picture eventually, but right now it's just that cloud cover kind of streaming in from the north and west that we'll have for the rest of the night. Most of those rain showers outside of the state of Wisconsin as of now, but even though we do have high pressure and control keeping the sunshine around for the most part, we actually have an upper level low. It's going to keep things a little bit unsafe settled and we'll have rain chances just about each and every day. That'll start tomorrow night going through Thursday. Let's go ahead and zoom this in closer to home and plan your weekend for you. By the time most of you guys are waking up tomorrow morning, expect temperatures to be into the 50s. We'll have some sunshine and some clear skies around clouds starting to increase by about lunchtime with temperatures approaching the mid 70s at that point later on into the afternoon. That's what we'll see more in the way of some of those isolated showers developing, though most of that should be to our north. It's not until we get you into Sunday that we'll see a more widespread chance. Again, starting out with temperatures into the 50s, 70s by lunchtime, and topping out into the 70s for your Sunday as well. Therefore, when it comes to your grill cast, we're going to have three grills for your weekend solely because there is that chance of an isolated shower just about each and every day. But the reality is we really do need the rain. There haven't been many days of rain for the month of July at all. For us here in Wisconsin, we're pacing just under three or just under seven tenths of an inch below average for the time of the year. In fact, we've now brought back the drought monitor for parts of central in northern Wisconsin. We're not in a drought for us here in Madison, but you see what I mean when I say we're going to want to go ahead and get some more rain chances back into the picture. Temperature wise, we will stay steady for the next several days with most of our temperatures staying into the upper 70s for those highs tomorrow. Not out of that as well. 79 will be your high. Very mild and then again that chance for some storms moving into the picture very late into the day tomorrow. Storm chances do increase as we go through Sunday and Monday and we're going to keep those daily rain chances around. Now, none of those days will be a washout. It's kind of more like a Florida kind of air mass that we have, even though it won't be that hot and humid. It's just one of those situations where most of the day is fine. And then into the afternoon and evening, you kind of get one of those shower chances that pops up here and there. And then back to the upper 80s. So there are some 80s on day 10. I chose not to mention <laughs> it just because I don't want to believe it yet. But, but summer's we'll not over yet. The summer is not over yet. All it right, does not officially end until September. So all right. Thank you, sir. Thank Anytime. you, Chris. This week marks the 40th anniversary of the first baby born through vitro infertilization or IVF. Since then, it's estimated as many as 8 million babies have been born because of continuing and rapid advancements in reproductive medicine. Henadoba has more. It's been a long journey, but 40-year-old Veronica Page Nell SBI is expecting her second child. After their son was born, Veronica and her husband Jorge knew right away they wanted to add to their family. But it's been difficult. Veronica had an ovary removed, four miscarriages, and several failed rounds of IVF. It's hard to stay with that hope and not give up. Before her most recent round of in vitro fertilization, Veronica had pre-implantation genetic screening, or PGS. Cells from the embryo are tested before the transfer back to the uterus to ensure it has the right number of chromosomes. The wrong number is a common cause of miscarriage. IVF is really one of the great success stories of modern medicine. Dr. Zev Williams at Columbia University Medical Center says doctors now have the ability to select the healthiest embryos. Instead of having to transfer multiple embryos, we could transfer one embryo 
and still give a high chance of success. Another major advance, PGD, or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. It helps doctors identify genetic defects within an embryo when parents are carriers of serious diseases. And for young women with cancer and women choosing to delay having children, fertility preservation has been a life changer. Once the egg or the embryo is frozen, it's like time has paused. So that the chances of that 40-year-old woman getting pregnant is essentially the same as when she froze her egg or embryo. Veronica says it's been worth the wait. People sometimes spend 10 years trying to conceive. I'm lucky that it took only three years, but it was still, you know, two years extra. Their baby girl is due October 8th on Veronica's birthday. And Adoba, CBS News, Weehawken, New Jersey. The genetic testing of embryos can sometimes take days or even weeks to get the results. Columbia researchers are currently working with new technology that would allow them to do that testing within hours. Big Amazing. improvement. Yeah. Yep. When we come back, Tom Cruise back on the big screen in another Mission Impossible film. And filming Mission Impossible Fallout took a toll on Tom Cruise. We'll preview the movie and find out how the actor was injured when Live at Four continues. Friday afternoon at the Union Terrace, temperatures in the 70s, yes please. Mm -hmm. Tom Cruise injured himself performing a stunt in the new Mission Impossible movie. Rick Damagella reveals, uh, reveals which one in this preview of Mission Impossible Fallout. What the hell is he doing? You find it best not to milk. He is Tom Cruise and in Mission Impossible Fallout he rides. Mm -hmm. He flies. We're all the when you are, Tom. Copy that. And he jumps out of a plane. 
at 25,000 feet. While crews learned to pilot a helicopter and perform the death-defying halo jump sequence, doing his own stunts wasn't without injury. I'm jumping out a window! The actor shattered his ankle while jumping between two buildings. I don't take anything for granted when we're doing it. Um, but it's just one of those things. It's just, you know, anytime you're doing a stunt, it's tricky. But it should have been way easier. But there's, there's always going to be heavy impact into that wall for me. <laughs> Uh, that's the nature of it, you know, even just you want the audience when I hit the side to so there I was going to take a hit So I was trying to mitigate it by putting my foot out a little bit just to soften the blow His co-stars have differing thoughts on Cruz's stunt work One thing Thomas taught me is that authenticity is, is, is a key to giving the audience a real thrill when they know what they're watching is happening When they know it actually happened for real there is something that you get which you can't get from faking it and uh, That's what he does. He jumped out of a a plane and free fell for 25,000 feet. I've been in planes where the pilot says, we have now reached cruising altitude at 35,000 feet. You can now, you know, you're free to get up. And he jumped out of the plane 10,000 feet lower. That's not right. In Hollywood and not doing my own stunts, I'm Rick Damagella. Mission Impossible Fall opens on Friday. Fallout. 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 That is pretty amazing at 57. Yeah. He does all of his own stunts. And it, the one, the, there's one stunt in Paris. It took two and a half years to figure out how to do it. Wow. Now we have to see the movie. Mm -hmm. We'll find out what our film critic Will Loper thinks of Mission Impossible Fallout. Monday here on Live at 4. Still to come tonight at 4, local playwright, a, local, a local playwright's work hits the Bartell stage this weekend. And we'll go backstage with our Michael Bruno to check out Diamond Girl. That's when Live at 4 continues.
Happy Friday. Congratulations, you have made it to the weekend. But before you get home, you're going to have a few slowdowns to deal with. Here's a live look. The Beltline at Todd Drive, especially as you start to head eastbound, you'll notice that traffic volume increasing and that speed eventually slowing down as well. So the Beltline full of brake lights at the moment. Most folks only moving anywhere between about 18 and 25 miles per hour as they work their way home to begin the weekend. So do be prepared for that as you begin to head on out. You head towards downtown 151 as you head inbound and outbound towards and away from the Capitol Square that has some brake lights showing up in Rose Street. Of course, we all know if you live around that area that you're going to have a lot of slowdowns around this time. The interstate does look good. So Madison, the only main slowdown spot in all of Dane County as of now for eastbound John Nolan towards the interstates moving around 40 miles per hour, but westbound John Nolan towards Verona Road that's moving at about 27 miles per hour as of now taking you half an hour from University to the interstate and just under 15 minutes eastbound on Verona Road towards John Nolan. Guys. All right, Chris, thank you. Well, the play is called Diamond Girl, and it's the work of a local playwright, Bruce Calder Cal Calhoun. It's being performed this weekend at the Bartell Theater, and our Michael Bruno goes backstage to check it out. Am I the face that launched a thousand ships? No. It's this necklace that drives men mad with desire that makes jealous the very gods. Oh, cursed be the day that Aphrodite collapsed it around my milk-white neck. The Diamond oh. Girl is uh, Chase, Rita Chase, and she is a sales associate at a jewelry boutique, and she also happens to live with her stepfather and stepsister. It's this necklace that drives men mad with desire. I've always been interested in uh, lost works of antiquity, and that is the subplot of this play, the search for the lost plays of the great Euripides, an uh, ancient Greek uh, writer, playwright. And I dovetailed it into just a fun tale about a magical necklace that a jewelry store woman tries on. It is all your doing. We also get to see a little bit of Rita's dream world. We see that Rita has the same sort of love for um, ancient Greek plays that her father does, and so we see a little bit of that play out in this dream sequence. But, uh, but why me? Why not Rita? Her blood will flow as freely as mine, and, and she's of no worth. Iffy I is the, I guess I would say kind of the, the nasty stepsister. Uh, she doesn't like to let Rita kind of down, uh, meaning like she likes to give, she likes to goad Rita into making her feel bad about herself. Curse you, Rita! There's a little oopsie daisy, and she gets this necklace stuck on her, and it's um, enchanted, they find out, and the only way to take it off is for her to find her true love. The winds have freshened. We will have uninvited guests from Akia soon. Worse for them. My quiver is full and my aim is true. I shall litter the shoreline with their corpses. Oh, sweet, useful Paris. Your arrows will not stop the likes of Menelaus and Ajax and Odysseus. Oh, if only I could tear off this necklace. If only I could rip it off and cast it into the foaming sea. Paris, help me rip it off. Help me, Paris. Help me. What well, happens? <laughs> <laughs> he helps her. <laughs> he helps himself to her. <laughs> he it, helps everybody. It's <laughs> nice to see a local work being done by, it is. by a local and, playwright. And not to get confused, that's a dream sequence within the play. So okay. the play isn't all a Greek tragedy. It's like that's her one of her like dream fantasies she has because she can't get the necklace off of her. But she can in real life. Well, exactly. Yes. Yeah. But in, in the play, she it she has to discover love and true love to, in order to remove the necklace. So she goes through a lot of series of like wondering of other people through history, famous women of history, uh, and how they would like come to, to come to find their true love. So you don't have to take a Greek mythology course no, before you, you don't. go. No, you do not have to. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> and this is it, it, pre, it premiered in Middleton. Yeah, so this is the encore performance. They're doing it again at, at the Bartell Theater stage, and it is a benefit for Save the Rainforest. So it's a really it's a wonderful, worthwhile uh, production helping raise money.
for them and yes. local, local talent as well. Very Absolutely. Good. All right, Diamond Girl Bartell Theater, Friday and Saturday, 7.30 Sunday, 2 o'clock, bartelltheatre.org. Coming up next week. Next week, it's Hello! Dolly, oh, if you were on strong that play. Show. A little different. A little different. <laughs> yes, the local version. <laughs> All right. Should we'll be see fun. if that shows up. <laughs> Have a good weekend. Thanks, you too. Michael. Have a good one. Final check your forecast coming up. Chris here with a weather recap. Looking good out there. It's going to be fantastic out there. Beautiful night in store. We'll see some clouds, but we'll be pleasant. Lows falling into the 50s eventually. In fact, our overnight low right around 56 degrees. Saturday is going to be another comfortable day as well. If you're going to do some grilling outdoors, I've given you three grills for both Saturday and Sunday. The only reason that I didn't go all the way with four is just because there's that isolated chance of a shower or two popping up. It's kind of like a Florida pattern, but with mm -hmm. a cold Canadian air mass, which is weird. But <laughs> that is. that's exactly kind of what we're dealing with. So I do want to make sure everyone's aware of that. But otherwise, this weekend's going to be great. Yeah, I know what you mean, the Florida weather. It's sunny all day. All of a sudden, there's a downpour. Yep, and then it goes away, and the sun's back. That's exactly what's going to happen. Looking forward to that. <laughs> all right, Chris, Thanks, thank Chris. you. Monday here on Live at 4, Dr. Zorba Pastor will be along to answer your medical questions live. And film critic Will Loper will tell us what he thinks of the movie we just reviewed, Tom Cruise's Mission Impossible Fallout. That's coming up Monday on Live at 4.
Well, our canine correspondents, Lola and intern Louie, have another good batch of animal stories from around the world. So without further ado, here's this week's edition of Lola's Lowdown. This week on the Lowdown, no lion. Up close and personal with mom and her cubs. And a British dog paddle. But first, a premature penguin chick has been saved by zookeepers in London. Keepers found one of this season's eggs had been accidentally broken by its parents and were astonished to find a tiny chick still alive inside. They feared the humbled penguin chick named Rainbow wouldn't survive without help so they rushed her to the zoo's on-site vet clinic, where the vet team sprang into action. She spent the next few weeks cozying up to a cuddly toy penguin, was fed three times a day, and now the one-month-old chick is on the road to adulthood. A story with a very cute and very happy ending. And speaking of cute, is it possible to get any cuter than this? The Royal Burger Zoo in the Netherlands released video of two Sri Lanka panther cubs playing with their mother. They used a tiny camera to film the playful two-month-olds in their indoor enclosure. Both cubs were born at the zoo back in May. There are fewer than 1,000 Sri Lanka panthers left in the wild. Royal Burger Zoo has bred this endangered species successfully for years now. What's the ideal tonic for a hot dog in the summer? Swimming, of course. Some of London's top dogs jumped into a city reservoir to cool off, chasing balls as part of a swimming gale.